Good afternoon, everyone. We are now in Numbers chapter 22. And as we proceed into Numbers 22, I would like to draw your attention to a, the previous chapter that we did last week. Uh, that we, well, we, we did give it a, a detailed treatment, but I just want to point out something that will link it to chapter 22. That would be in chapter 21, uh, in verse 27, right? 26, 27. When you take a look at this, these are the cities that Israel went to take from the Amorites, right? In Heshvon. Uh, as you can see, this, this is uh, not somewhere at the northern part of uh, the, the land of Moab, right? Now, Hesh, uh, Hesh, Heshbon is, used to belong to Moab. If you look at verse 26, Heshbon was the city of Sihon, the king of Amorites, who fought against the former king of Moab and had taken all his land from his hand for, from as far as are known. And, and this basically tells us that Heshbon, as well as all the way to Arnon, used to be in the hands of the Moabs, right? It is Moabite territory. Now, the reason why I brought this up is for us to carry on into verse uh, chapter 22 about the proverb. Somebody who would say this proverb, this is really indirectly a, well, I guess you could say it, prophetic words. It says, come to Heshbon, let it be built. Let the city of Sihon be repaired. And basically what you would find is that Heshbon is taken as a city of Sihon. So all of this is taken by the king, uh, by Sihon, king of the Amorites. And, and just be mindful that these were prophetic words. Now in, in, in Jewish tradition, these prophetic words are actually were actually spoken by Balaam, which is where we are going into chapter 22 now. So just bear that in mind. Given the background of chapter 21, as you recall, Moses led the children of Israel, took everything that King Sihon had, as well as King Og. These were territory that was north of Moab, which also means that a part of the northern part of Moab, which was taken by King Sihon, was also taken by the children of Israel. And so now, and then means after everything was done in the northern part, uh, north of Moab, all the way up to Bashan, the children of Israel moved down south and camped in the plains of Moab, the side of Jordan, across from Yericho, right? Ye uh, Yericho is a city which in the book of Joshua would be uh, one of those major cities that was taken um, in the very early part of the conquest. And so they were what we would call the plains of Moab. Now, the plains of Moab is also called the, the desert of Moab. This is a desert area. It is flat. Understand that it is flat. It is large. It is on the eastern shore. The side of Jordan means this is the eastern shore. And it's across from, well, the word across from is supplied by the translator, but it is, uh, it would be opposite. Opposite. Two, 
to Jericho, all right? Uh, on, on the side opposite to Jericho. And basically what you would find is that this is a, a place where the children of Israel would stay for quite a while. However, it is in Moab. It is in Moab beside the, uh, the, the Jordan River. Now, as you recall, as they were traveling up, they were not allowed to enter into Edom, but they passed through uh, Moab to Ammon and then into the northern part. Now, all the conquests of the north has been done. They come back to the eastern shore of the Jordan River and they rest there. Right? They rest there. Now, it's important that in chapter the next few chapters talk about a very critical situation. Let me, by way of introduction, uh, describe uh, a number of background elements to you. This is at a time before they entered into the promised land. This is also at a time uh, of the book of Deuteronomy. Uh, and it is also at a time where they have completed the conquest of the eastern side of the Jordan. And we read that in the previous chapter. They're now resting at the plains of Moab or the desert of Moab. It's a very large piece of uh, land. And uh, next to the river where they are fed is also very flat. And it will allow a large contingent of Israelites to, to remain there. However, they are in the region of Moab, which is where the narrative will take us. It's about Moab now. Now, Moab lost Hezbon to Sihon. Uh, and as I indicated, that uh, it was most likely based on the prophecy or the words spoken by Balak, uh, sorry, by Balaam, right? Now, Balak is the king of Moab at this time. He is the son of Zippor. He saw, now understand, all of these elements, they're all very visual. That all that Israel had done to the Amorites, this would be Sihon and Og. These are the Amorite kings. And Balak was not able to fight Sihon, and that's why he lost uh, a great deal of his territory to Sihon, which the children of Israel now took. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people. Who were these people? Israel. Because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So if you look at verses like these, you would be able to see that uh, afraid of the people, this would be children of Israel. They were many children of Israel. How many? As the stars of the sky. That's how many they are now. And so now exceedingly afraid and sick with dread, they are also the same expression. So we have an A and a B right here exceedingly uh, afraid. This really means um, gore, right? Gore. Is, well, I guess you can use the word um, all afraid in all. Now, this would be the proper English word or uh, because it is not about uh, the modern day expression. No? It's awesome. Or means it is so spectacular, shocking. Uh, that would be a better way of expressing it. Be in or that would be the, the proper traditional English or or dread. They're so afraid. Uh, that they are standing in awe. The other word right there, uh, 
this would be um how should we say um sick with dread is actually a correct way of expressing um they are so distressed distressed with fear basically i guess when you read two statements that is saying the same thing about the children of israel um you are you are actually seeing how how scared moab was like scared so scared that they were they were shaking in their pants right in a more colloquial expression and moab said to the elders of median median appears to be the place where jethro was right jethro the father in law of moses was a priest of uh, of median we believe that the place of Medan would be down south, um, in the northern part of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, below Edom, uh, and they had mixed with the Ishmaelites. Now, the elders of Median were their advisors. Now, this company will lick up everything around us as ox licks up the grass of the field. Now, the idea here of licking, how should we say it? It's more of um, to lick up the way the, um, the, 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 the cows eat up grass is they suck it in and they, 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 then they chew it in while it's in their mouth, right? But it gives us a picture where it is, you're always seeing the tongue of the ox. Uh, and he's giving a picture that, well, an ox is not a wild animal. It is a very tame animal. It, it's a domesticated animal. And yet it is giving an illustration that it can just come in and pick anything up which they see. Now, what is important is then Balak, the king of the Moabites at that time, sent messengers to Balaam. Now, this word in the Hebrew is um, Bil'am. Let me just give you the Hebrew name, Bil'am. Or in the English, Balaam, um, the son of Beor. Uh, and it is at Petorah, Petor, right, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, "Look, a people has come from Egypt, so they they have heard the Exodus, and see they cover the face of the earth, and this would be a picture of the desert or plains of Moab." If you had a chance to go to Jordan, you will be able to see that uh, from the top where they call Mount Nebo, uh, you can actually look down to the northern part of the Dead Sea, and that whole area that would be the plains of Moab. And it is a huge flat piece of land. And, and if the people of Israel were encamped there, uh, I'm sure the Moabites would be able to see them. And so they said, see, that's exactly what they're talking about. See, you can actually see how many they are. And they have settled next to me. Now, most likely that the king of um, Moab would be in the higher area. One of the interesting geographical uh, facts of of, um, of Jordan is that Amman is really almost 2,000 feet above sea level. Very, very high, higher than Jerusalem. Uh, and then it goes all the way down to the plains of Moab, where the Israelites are, and that would be below sea level. 
uh, at the Dead Sea. And that gives us a, a huge difference in temperature. It also gives us an, a, a picture that the king of Moab, Balak, has a bird's eye view vantage point of looking down on the people of Israel. And so now the request to, um, to Bilam or Balaam is this. Say, therefore, please come at once. Curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. I can't fight them. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them after that and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom you bless is blessed. Him he, who you curse is cursed. Now, just for our purposes, we need to just break this down a little before we move on. In verse 6, it says curse and the word curse is ara. And this word curse uh, essentially is to execrate, you know, is to say something bad. Uh, to befall a people. That's the word curse here. This people would be Israel. Do that for me uh, because they are too mighty. The, the word mighty here means very strong. It also means numerous. And so what how, how, why do you think Balak is doing that? It's because they, he wants Balaam or Bilam to curse them such that they will be weakened, such that somehow their numbers will be smaller, so that somehow they can, the, the, the Moabites can defeat them. And not only defeat them, but to drive them out of the land so that they would not be a threat to Moab. And Mo, the Balak, the Moabite king, believes that whom Bilam bless, and the word bless here is um, Barak, the, the usual word, when you say good things, good things will happen that, to them. When you say bad things, bad things will happen to them. Just remember this word, ara, right? Ara, this is to say bad things, to say nasty things about them. And the intent is to drive them out of the land, right? Intent is to drive them out of the land. And so that is the intent of Balak with Bilam or Balaam. Now, Obviously, Balaam is situated quite far away and the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the diviner's fee in their hand. Now, understand that there is a diviner's fee. So, the idea of diviner's fee would be the, 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 the reward for a prophet. Right, whether uh, in this case a false prophet for saying things, right? So they call it a diviner's fee. Some somebody that would say things with, with um, well, I guess things that will come to pass. And then they went both the elders of Moab, the elders of Median, went to look for Balaam, and they spoke to him the words of Balak, and he said to them. Well, guys, the elders, please stay here tonight. The idea of lodge is to, to stop here tonight. And I will bring back word to you as the Lord. And you must realize that he has an ability, we'll talk about it, to speak to God. As God speaks to me. And so the princes of Moab stayed with Balaam, uh, Balaam, right? Now, this idea uh, in verse 8, when he says the princes, it's the Tsar, right? This word is the Tsar. 
like Sar Shalom, Prince of Peace. So they they are really uh, leaders, leaders, chiefs, right? Uh, these are noble men. And so these were the elders. So they are the princes of Moab. So next time when you read the word princes of Israel, or princes of a, a, a particular state, it, it really talks about the leaders, right? The chiefs. Uh, these are the people uh, who are taking on leadership position. Verse 9. Then God came to Balaam, and God here is Elohim. I just gave you some of the Hebrew words so that you know what is behind some of these English words. And God came to uh, Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Now understand, it's not that God didn't know, I suppose. Uh, it's like um, God in the garden saying, Where are you? Who are these men? So when you say God came to Balaam, uh, we're not talking that God actually walked into his bedroom. Uh, what we have seen is that beyond Moses, we see that people are spoke to God through a shadow, uh, through a veil, uh, through dreams, in, and never in a direct way. But they, these people would, would know. So Balaam seems to have an ability to see God, right? See through veil or dream or vision. And he communicates with God. Now we see that when God spoke to Pharaoh, for example, right? Uh, in uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, when Abram and Sarai went into uh, Egypt, and so now we see God appearing and and, and addressing non-Israelites. Very unusual, but it happens. Uh, does God speak to other people? We we are seeing uh, instances, and we are seeing one of those rare instances here, Balaam is not a prophet of God in the sense of the word. Uh, Balaam is not a prophet in the sense of Samuel. Uh, Balaam is not a prophet in the sense of Moses and Joshua. Uh, and so right now we have Moses still alive and Moses is able to communicate with God as a friend face to face. Balaam also, but indirectly. And so now we see God speaking, and, and Balaam knows that God here is Jehovah. And so God came to Balaam and says, Who are these men with you? And Balaam said to God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, have sent to me, saying, Look, a people has come out of Egypt, and they cover the face of the earth. Come now, curse them for me. Now, this is where I want to point out to you the word curse is different from the word that uh, Balak used. This word curse is kavav. Right? Kavav. And uh, how should I say? Kavav. And this is a very strong word. This is a very strong word. Uh, it says, Kavav them for me. Not Ara, but Kavav. Ara may, merely says bad things, right? Kavav literally gives the most serious and severe... Ex um, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a form of stabbing by words. And uh, he is misquoting Balak for perhaps intentional. And then that uh, Balak shall be able to overpower them. The word overpower them 
is to engage in battle. Engage in battle. Now, does that mean that Balak could not engage in battle? No, 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 no. Balak could engage in battle, but he knew that he was going to lose. So he never engaged. So technically speaking, looking at so not the numerous and, and strength of the army of Israel, Moab could not even start a war. But he wanted Balaam to curse, which is Ara, say bad things so that they would not be so strong and then they can actually, Balak can actually engage them in fight, right? Uh, and then drive out. Drive out means drive away. The, the intent of this drive out is not just drive out of the land because this, if you look at what this word and these words here as a pair imply something much more than taking them out of the land, uh, imply something more severe than saying something nasty. And because of the choice of words that Balaam made, then God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not, and that's verse 12, curse the people. And this word curse is using ara, a lighter a word, which is what uh, Balak actually meant. You shall not curse the people. They are blessed. They are blessed by God. We continue in verse 13. Morning came, Balaam ba 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 rose in the morning. And so this implies that there was a possible dream or a vision that he saw of God. And that was at night. And it's quite interesting that, um, that, that all these happen at night and not in the daytime in terms of his vision. Uh, we, we read of uh, Daniel doing the same in Daniel 2. Uh, telling the king, tonight I will talk to God. And so just like Balaam or Bilam, he says, tonight I'll talk to God. And so he said to the princes of Balak, go back to your land for the Lord. Who is the Lord? Yehovah. Yehovah uh, has refused. Now the word refused literally means um how should we say um this word refuse is utterly deny uh permission it's quite interesting phrase actually this word refuse to give me permission is one word right so utterly deny permission. Uh, and it says to, to walk back with you. And so B Balaam says that uh, I, I have no permission to go with you. Right? That's basically the, the whole picture. Um, and interestingly is you would see that this is not a true prophet of God. Uh, he has his own agenda. He really wanted to go, but he wasn't sure if God would allow. So he asked God and it couldn't, and he was disappointed. And the princess of Moab rose, went back to Balak and says, Balaam refuses to come with us. And then Balak sent again princes, more numerous, uh, more honorable than they. Now understand this. More, more, um, more honorable, more honorable, more numerous, so more in number. No, more in number, uh, more in 
force more in honor this is heaviness more in importance why because the first round were just elders they were the chiefs so balak thought that well let me send them in more important roles perhaps that could interest him now they didn't realize that balak wanted uh, balam uh, bilam wanted to go uh, but god wouldn't allow and so it was blamed to god and so they came to balam again and says well that says the son of uh, balak uh, son of Zippor, let nothing hinder you from coming to me. Don't let anything stop you from coming. Now, what does that mean? In verse 16, it says, let nothing stop you. Let nothing hold you back, right? Hold you back. For coming, for I will certainly honor you greatly. Uh, verse 16 and 17 now, that I will honor you greatly. I will do whatever you say to me. Now, why is he so anxious? Because of what he has seen happen to him with Sihon. And that was the uh, Proverbs that I referred you to in chapter 21. Therefore, please come, uh, curse this people for me. And this word curse uh, is now a, is now kavav. A stronger word. A stronger word. And that would be the word that ba uh, Balaam used when talking to God. And then Balaam, uh, Balaam answered, Oh, though Balak would have given me his house full of silver and gold, I could not go beyond the word of the Lord of my God. Now, interestingly, you could look at this expression. Balaam called God the Lord my God. Right? The Lord my God. And this is the formal name of God. It tells us that um, he has been doing things on behalf of God. Uh, he has been uh, he has been used by God to speak, and, and well, I guess in that sense, a form of a prophet, and he understands this. He is doing it for money, now, nevertheless, but he understands this point of view. He says, I will only do what God says uh, to do less or uh, to, I cannot do less or more. I can only do exactly what the word of God says. Now, this word, word is not davar, by the way. Uh, I think we could use the word the mouth, right? The mouth of God says. And so Balaam would listen to what God tells him to do. And it's not davar because it's not about a complaint uh, likened to Israel. It is probably tasks that were entrusted to him to execute. And so it says, now, therefore, please, you stay here tonight that I may know what more the Lord will say to me. Now, understand, in the whole emotion of things, you can see that Balaam really wants to go. And Balaam knows that he'll be very well rewarded. But because of his obligation to uh, God, he is very careful. At least he knows his boundaries but nevertheless in his heart he really wants to go so he will go and ask permission again and see what God will say verse 20 then God came to Balaam at night again 
if the men come to you to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. And so understand that this only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do, is something which Balaam knows and he is duly reminded, right? Duly reminded. The men will come and call you. And I think we can check out this word. Um, this word, um, if or when, and the men are already there, basically. And so this, this phrase itself, come to call you. Now this word, come to call you, really comes to call you to go and will pay you uh, to do whatever you need to do. Uh, then you should go with them. Now this is what Balaam hears. Go with them. Balaam understands that this is the parameter that he is supposed to do. And he is about to be a rich man after this. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princess of Moab. And now we have an entourage. And this would be a huge entourage. Why huge? Because there were more people, more important, um, more rank, and, and more whatever. And they are escorting Balaam to the king of Moab, Balak. Now, this is a big deal. Now, prophets of God don't do this. And in this case, you can see that the prophet of uh, the, Balaam is not really what I would call a prophet of God, but in, in, the, in the full sense of the word. Uh, but uh, Balaam nevertheless speaks on behalf of God. God, uh, and whether he would do them would be something that he will have to decide for himself. Now comes a more interesting part of the narrative in verse 22. Now in verse 22, now in verse 22, God's anger was aroused. Uh, literally knows was hot. Because he went, who is he? Bilam, right? Or Balaam. Uh, let's pause here for a moment and, and reflect on this. Uh, in the previous two verses, uh, right before this, verse 20, right? Uh, God came to the prophet at night and said that if, when these people come to call you, uh, and, and, and if they, the men can't come to call you, then go, go with them and only do what I tell you to do. Uh, and now God's anger was aroused because he went. And this was a perennial question that many people had. I don't think it's that easy to spot it from the English. But the idea here was that um, God doesn't want Balaam to curse the people. And by him going so anxiously and looking at the money that's in for them, he really wanted to go. And he wanted God just to say, okay, it doesn't matter what else that he needs to do. He just wanted to say, okay. The impression that would be given to the men who came to see, uh, to see Bela would be that God, uh, his God, Jehovah, would have agreed to curse the people of Israel by going with them. That, that was the picture. That would be the impression uh, God says, if you go with them, 
then you cannot do anything except what I tell you to do. And, and you, I think it would be granted that Balaam knows that there is no way on earth that God is allowing Balaam to curse his people because he already said that this people is blessed. But by not saying what God told, the whole story, right? Uh, God says, when the men come, go with them, but whatever I tell you, you must do. That whole piece was left out. And when you leave out that piece of information, the impression that would be left with these people would be, wow, great. God finally allows Balaam to go and curse the people for Balak so that Balak can overpower these people and chase them out of the land. That was why God was angry. And so God sent, uh, in verse 22, uh, God sent the angel of the Lord. And understand this again, the angel, this is a small a or messenger. I suggest we'll never look at all these uh, capital letters. Um, this would be really an angel, the angel that belongs to Jehovah, a messenger. The messenger is not the message itself. The messenger bears the message for the person or the party who has the message, and that would be God, God's message. All right? God's message. And so he took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Now understand, an adversary here uh, is the word, let me use a different color so that you can see, is the word Satan. And now we have angel of the Lord as Satan against Bil'am. Uh, so let me just briefly explain and then we'll move on uh, when we have time. Uh, one day we will discuss this. Satan basically is not a name. It is a role. Uh, it is uh, a role that an angel takes when he stands against something. Right? He stands against. Now, in this case, uh, this particular angel is Satan against uh, Bil'am. In Job chapter 1 and 2, there was another angel that was Satan uh, against God. Uh, so, that, that would be the role that we, we can think about, right? So, let's move on. Bilam was riding on his donkey. His two servants were with him. Now, understand this. This is a huge entourage. Huge entourage. This is not a narrow road. It's not like a, a two-man uh, job. This is a huge group of people going back to Moab, to the king, Balak. And he was really in great dignity. Uh, he was very elated, very happy. He was going back. People thinking that uh, God has allowed him to curse the Israelites. And so now the donkey saw. Now always we see, uh, whenever we talk about the donkey, this I think would be uh, a she... A she donkey <laughs> okay I, I want to put the gender in it is a she donkey uh, and he had two servants with him now understand it was not just uh, Balaam and the two servants it's Balaam the two servants and a whole entourage of people and he is not about to be embarrassed and only the donkey could see this is literally C, right? The she, the donkey itself 
saw the angel of God standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. And the donkey turned aside out of the way and went into the field. Literally, what happened? Well, if I were to draw you a picture, it would be this. The angel of God had in his hand a sword and Bill Arm had his donkey and he would be seated here. And the donkey could not move forward. And so what did the donkey do? There is no such thing called go around the angel. And so the donkey went off, went off the track. That's the whole picture that we have to see. And so he went into the field, out of the road. So turned aside out of the way and went into the field are actually the same, is actually the same thing, right? Basically to tell you where he went. And so Balaam struck the donkey to turn her back, back to the road. And the, the idea of, uh, of struck the donkey uh, in verse 23 uh, comes from the word, you know, when, when, when God struck Egypt with a plague, right? When, when, when they struck the enemy uh, to destroy them, that's the word struck. And it is a very strong word. And, and this is strike uh, and beat. Uh, and, it, and sometimes it is translated as kill and, or destroy. And so this is the, the, the impression that you would see is he's not just lightly hitting the, the back of the donkey. He is literally wanting to kill the donkey. He was that upset. Now, you need to understand, one of the reasons why he was so upset was because now he's so embarrassed. Everybody's moving straight and his donkey went off road. Uh, that, that would be an embarrassment. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between the vineyards with a wall on this side and a wall on that, a very narrow path. Donkey saw the angel of the Lord push herself against the wall and crush Balaam's foot against the wall. This time round, it was a narrow uh, path. And instead of walking in the middle, the she-donkey went to the side to squeeze by. And therefore, in verse 25, the word uh, crushed. Uh, the word crushed is actually uh, to, well, let's see, to squeeze. to squeeze, to force Balaam's foot against the wall because the, the, the donkey was actually trying to squeeze through, right? And then he struck her again, second time. Verse 26, the angel of the Lord went further, stood in a narrow place where there was no way to turn, either right hand or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, what did it do? Uh, it lied down. Basically, this word here is to stretch out. The donkey just stretched out. Uh, and if you think of it, the donkey would might be uh, on his knees or on his belly, perhaps, with the legs out. A very unusual pose. And Balaam was still sitting on top and the donkey wasn't going anywhere anymore. And so Balaam was hot in his nose and he struck the donkey with his staff. Now understand, the same word is used three times, right? Three times the word is used to strike the donkey as if he is trying to kill it. Now, that would be the background of the picture here.
Verse 28 onwards uh, would be a very interesting uh, exchange. But at this point in time, since we're uh, short of time, let me just park this and we will continue uh, next week from verse 28 onwards.